Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Luis, and I am an alcoholic. Can you see me in the way, all the way in the back? Uh, and stand up. Uh, well, it's not that important that you see me. What is important today is that you can hear me and that you can listen. Because many times I went to meetings and I didn't listen. And there were signs there of a disease that is called alcoholism. And Luis has a disease and ill and sick of the disease, alcoholism. I didn't know that until I got to AA. Um, I was born in San Jose, Costa Rica. So if you think that uh, you are an alcoholic because you were born in North Hollywood, no. That's not the reason. I developed some of my alcoholism in North Hollywood. Most of my favorite bars are in North Hollywood. At the end of my drinking, any bar that would serve me was my favorite bar. By the age of 25, I was done with the country of Costa Rica. My perception was that uh, everybody hated me there. From the president of the country, <laughs> who didn't know who I was, to my neighbors, to my parents, to my employers, to my brothers, to my uh, friends. Everybody hate me there. I didn't know at that time that I have a disease, the disease that I just told you I have, alcoholism, and that most of us have. And that's the reason we are here together. We probably have people here that live in million dollar houses. We probably have people here that's sleeping in the car today. We probably have people here today that is their first day to those that raise your hand today and say, I need your help, welcome. My first 30 days in this programs, in this program were very difficult. I was very happy that I was not drinking, but I was always thinking, oh, I have to raise my hand again. My ego. I have a friend in my Monday meeting that says, my ego is not my amigo. <laughs> I didn't know him, I didn't know what he meant in the first 30 days. I know what he means now. Um, I think it was Randy that read uh, chapter five, and she was reading about honesty. How important is honesty in this program? Chapter 5 describes, uses the word honesty three times in the first paragraph. It and tells me, if you are not honest in this program, I think you're wasting your time. That's what it tells me. Because when my sponsor told me, in my first 30 days, you need to be rigorously honest with me, but mainly with you. I say, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. In order to drink the way that I drank, I have to lie. In order to drink the way that I drank, I have to tell my employer, I couldn't come Monday because my mother died on Saturday. I was called by an employer one time 
in Costa Rica, those that hate me and ask me, you know, we have been auditing the records of the employees and, and the bank is very careful about employees that uh, don't come to work on Monday. And uh, this is a bank. And people come to cash their checks here on Mondays. And they get very upset when nobody's there in the cash. But the, the reason that I call you here in my office is not because those absences that we know already. The reason is that the audit shows that your mother has died twice in the last year. <laughs> seconds. Seconds, because the alcoholic that drinks like I do has to have that. That fast thinking. And I say, that was my stepmom. <laughs> and he told me, I'm sorry, Luis. This time, I'm sorry. We already know what your problem is, and we have to let you go. You are a great employee when you don't drink. We loan you the car of the company, and somebody told us that that car was parked in front of the bar at 4 o'clock in the morning. That's not where we want to see the sign of our bank. <laughs> we have to let you go. And my reaction was, these guys hate me. These guys hate me. Why is my father closing the door at, at 12 o'clock at night and asking me for money to pay the rent of the house? I need that money to drink. So I was fired from that job, and I decided that it was time to go and look for a better country. <laughs> and I have a brother that lived here since the 1950s. Very hardworking man. The oldest of my family. You know, and the youngest in my family. And he was the oldest. And uh, he has worked very hard here he, he, since he came here. He's not an alcoholic. And he went over to visit there and he saw me in such a shape. But he said, you know what? Let's go with me. I help you with her. I give you a job. I give you a place to live. And you start all over again. I said, I don't need to start all over again. I just need a change of location. And two months later, that plane was leaving San Jose. And I remember as that plane was leaving... Looking down, you know, to the window, I say, oh, wow, what a release. I don't have to pay those debts that I owe these guys over there. I don't have to any more hide from the bartender of the corner of the neighborhood there. I don't have to, I don't have to lie anymore to this lady that, uh, that I had a daughter with. I don't have to look for a job anymore in that place where they hate me. Because they hate me. Everybody hate me. My parents hate me. Leave me alone. I don't care. I call my disease my the, the disease of I don't care. Because I didn't care anymore about anybody. I didn't care about my parents. I didn't care about my employers. I didn't care about my friends. I didn't care about anybody. What I have found now, thanks to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps, is that I care. My disease is the one that don't care. It's two different things. Here I am, as an alcoholic in recovery, giving my family the best of my life. As I was coming here today, my daughter grabbed me, gave me a big hug before I leave the house and said, tell them that you helped me do the homework. Tell me that you show, tell them that you did the last math program problem with me. I feel that now. 
I didn't care before. I was at the bar many times at night and with my first daughter. I, did, I don't remember doing the homework with her. I don't remember going to a school meeting with her. The disease that I, that I, don't, that, oh, I don't care. I don't remember taking my mother to a Mother's Day dinner. I don't remember giving my family a medical insurance. I don't remember paying insurance in my car as a drinking person, as a sick man that needed this program since he was about, I don't know, 15, 20, maybe since I was born. Was I born an alcoholic? Did I get it from my father? Did I get it because that people hate me in Costa Rica? Did I get it because my employer didn't like me? I don't care. It doesn't matter how I got to be an alcoholic. The important thing today is that I know that if I have a drink today, I have a disease. And it starts this physical reaction that says, more, more. <laughs> more and I can stop and I will drink and I will spend every cent that I have it doesn't matter I don't care if it is for the for the rent I don't care if it is for for my daughter's school I will spend every cent that's mine oh <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I can tell you stories of the disease of alcoholism. Where did it take me? I went to places that I would have never believed. When the plane landed here at the Los Angeles airport, a free man. No deaths, a new life, a new house. My brother promised me a job. Wow, finally, where is the bar? <laughs> <laughs> finally, I can drink free. And I learned to say some words like uh, double. Uh, where? Where was very important. Where is it? Where is the bar? Where is the drink? Uh, one more. That was so important. And I learned that when they say last call, I have to hurry up as for three drinks. Give me three. It's last call. And very soon, just a couple of years after I got here, I was doing the same exact thing that sent me out of my own country. I didn't know that when I came here, in that plane I was carrying the disease of alcoholism with me. I didn't know that in that plane I was carrying the disease that I don't care. I didn't know that I was going to come here and live the same life and worse of the life that I was living over there. That's why for the newcomers, I can tell you right here, right now, that I'm convinced because of my own life, because of my own experience, that this is a disease. It's a mental, physical, and a spiritual disease. I have a daughter my oldest daughter is 32 years old. I have a son who's 26 uh, from a previous relationship and a previous first marriage. And then I have a, my, a second marriage and my daughter, uh, Ariana, who's 11, 11 years old, the one that I help for the homework today. My family is a family in recovery. 
because the disease of alcoholism is not his family disease. In my house, in my family, my wife is affected, my daughter is affected, my daughters, my son is affected, my parents, my brothers, my sisters. And it's not easy to get sober and after everything clears up and you look around and see that devastation and see all those broken pieces of relationships. I'm going to tell you how I got here. It's very painful for me, but I have to tell you. After trying a few times to, to do this program, and I never made it because I never wanted it. I needed it, but I never wanted it. One day my daughter called me, my oldest daughter called me from San Francisco and said, Dad, I'm going to get married on September 19. That was September 19, 1997. She, she, I talked with her about August. And she said, I don't, I called you because I'm going to get married, but you're not welcome. This time is my party. It's my wedding. This time you're not going to be the one calling the shots. This time I don't want you around. What? I'm your dad. I'm your father. I don't care who you are. You're not going to mess up my my life anymore. I don't want to see you there, and I don't want to see you anymore in my life. You tell that to an alcoholic like me drinking, and I assure you that there is a one month straight drinking coming on. And I start drinking day and night. Day and night, day and night, left my work, left my clients, left everything because it was the great, the great thing to do. Alcohol relieved me of that pain. He did it all the time. But I said, I'm going to go to that wedding. I'm going to go to that wedding. I'm going to show this girl my ego. I didn't think that she was my daughter at that time or anything. I didn't care. Alcoholism is a disease of I don't care. I don't care it was my daughter. I just care about me. Selfish behavior. A few days later, I say, I want to go, but I want to go sober. I want to go sober. I really want to go sober. I couldn't stop drinking. So I come, I have this car that, that, Someone who became my sponsor had given me, and he's here today. And I thank him for all his help, Dick Jensen. And I call him, drunk. I don't know what I said. It's very foggy those days, you know. And I keep calling him and calling him. And, and he keeps saying, call me tomorrow. Don't drink. Don't drink. <laughs> That's the only way that I can talk when I'm drunk. Finally, I don't know how, but I ended up going with him to a meeting. And I got to the meeting, Monday night meeting, and, um, well, he became my sponsor. He asked me, you have to be honest. You have to go to any length. When I was a week sober, any land was just go to a meeting. Any land was just pick up a chair and put it. Any land was just to answer your hello. That land start going farther and farther. Right now is treat my family with respect. Right now that land is treat my employer with honesty. Right now is listen to the twelve steps where they where it says you have to give up the 
the the right to be right. It's not, it doesn't matter if you're right anymore. Why do you insist, Luis, on being right all the time? Why do you have to go to that wedding? Just to show up who? What? Selfish. My disease is selfish. I just think of me. Dick took me to meetings for that week. He knew that I want to go over to you. And I was lying to him. I was drinking. I drink in the morning, I stop until about one or two, I slept for a couple hours, and then finally on Friday I told him, Dick, I have been drinking. And he said, well, I'm glad you told me, show me you want to be honest. Your daughter is getting married tomorrow, and we're going to a meeting. And I said, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and Samuel said, no, I'm going to the wedding. He said, no, let's go to a meeting. And I went to a meeting with him, and I raised my hand, and that was my first day of being honest with myself. I raised my hand, and I asked you for help, and I cried that day. And I cried desperately in front of you. Because it's the first time in my life that I've been honest with me. It's the first time that really, really inside, I left my university courses at home. I left my, my employers. I left my, 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 my hate for the, the people hate me. I hate all the stuff and I told you the truth and I say, I need your help. My daughter is getting married at this moment. I was not invited to her wedding. What she was saying, I do. I was saying, help me. And you have helped me. Just to finish this cycle of this relationship, for the last eight years and a half, I haven't speak, I have spoke once to my daughter in a funeral. And it was just a, hi, don't get close to me. I have made amends to her. In, in writing her and everything. I have discussed hours and hours with my sponsor who has called me and said, give her space. Let her go. No, I want to go. No, I want to go and visit her. No, I want to control her life. No, I want her to, to, to see her for Christmas. No. Last year, she sent me a Christmas card. And it was fantastic. I didn't talk to her, but it was great just to see her riding. On Thanksgiving Day this year, I had the great, the great moment of my life of being there and my daughter show up and said, can I talk to you? And we went walking. Yes, these are tears. Tears of I care. I care for my daughter now. I care for you, the newcomers mainly. Because I know what it is in a room, to be in a room in Hollywood Boulevard. I know what it is to be in downtown, in the prison, in, in, in the county jail. I know what it is to be lying to, to my wife. Lying to my daughter, lying to everybody. And my daughter called me and we walk in this farm that we were from Thanksgiving, all my family. And everybody thought there was going to be a fight. It was tense. My sister were. <laughs> everybody said, oh my God, they're going to fight. They're going to kill each other. And we came back. And I was holding her like this. I cannot tell you that she told me that she loves me. No. I can tell you that she loved me, that she told me why she doesn't want me here close to her. And she said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But I'm working on it. Twelve steps 
has taken me from I don't want you around my life to I'm working on it and I'm waiting and I feel happy about it. Alcoholism. One time I was in this bar, the, one of those favorite bars that I had before, here in North Hollywood, by the way. And, and I was there, and it was closed in December at this time of the year. And the bar attender said, you know, well, Luis, you have been here the whole day. Uh, why don't you stay for the employees party? I said, oh, great. <laughs> How much do I owe you? You owe me about $60. Okay, I pay you tomorrow. Is that okay? No, you pay me now. You can say, okay, I pay you now. Um, we were in the, everybody getting ready and everything. And the guy, the bar attender came over to me, uh, not to me, to somebody next to him, um, next to me and was telling him, you know, God, that's stupid. He didn't use that word. Santa Claus. That's stupid Santa Claus. He said he was going to be here about half hour ago, and we are already ready to ready to give the gifts to the kids of the of the employees and everything. And Santa Claus is not here, and there is the dress that he was going to wear. And I said, "This is no problem. I dress as Santa Claus. I dress. Don't worry. I make up." And they put me this dress, this costume dress, and gave me a couple of drinks and. And I just started, ho, 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 ho. And I find out something. The more ho, ho that I said, the more drinks they sent me at the bar. And they start sending me drinks that night. And I ended up drunk, Santa Claus. <laughs> giving presents to the wrong person. Forget it, I don't care, I don't want to give more presents anymore. Anyway, I like the experience. I got so drunk that next day I said, Oh my God, I'm going to buy one of those dresses, one of those costumes, and I'm going to start dressing as Santa Claus. I need money anyway. And I, and I went and bought a very cheap Costume of Santa Claus. It cost me about eighteen dollars or something like that. <laughs> one of those made out of like like paper, you know. That one day get wet, they get all messed up, and and I show up to bars, and before I get in, I dress up as Santa Claus in the car, and came in and say, ho ho ho, ho ho. Who is that stupid man there? <laughs> Oh, Luis, it's you. Oh, come on in. No, no, no. <laughs> the Christmas came that year, and I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait for the next Christmas. I say, I'm going to buy a better one, and I became a professional Santa Claus. <laughs> I went to Hollywood Boulevard to that costume thing that they have, that they sell all kind of costumes, and I bought a better dress with bell and, and everything. <laughs> And I became the Santa Claus of the nightclubs. <laughs> I became the Santa Claus of the Latin bars. <laughs> and one of my requirements it was no kids. No kids. This is a special Santa Claus. The disease of I don't care. The disease of I don't care took the character of Santa Claus and destroyed it. <laughs> you know, it is funny, but it is painful. It is painful because I saw the eyes of a kid one day in a restaurant, I got so drunk that I fell down on the floor dressed as Santa Claus. And this kid was walking with his, with, uh, you know, his mom, maybe an eight-year-old, seven-year-old. And he came and looked at me. 
and turned to his turned his eyes to his mom and said, "Mom, Santa Claus is drunk." <laughs> You know, sometimes I wish that this story uh, it, it will be true. Sometimes I think that I'm making that up, but I'm not making that up. It's a true story. It's a true story, and I remember getting home that night with the dress of Santa Claus all messed up. You know, the bird down here and. The, the pillow that I used to was here in my back. And I remember looking at the, at the, at the mirror in my, be, in my bedroom, in the bathroom, and saying, You are a son of a bitch. You are nobody. You are nothing. You don't have any values. You don't care about anything. How can you do this to a kid as young as your, as your own son? How can you take this character and make people hate him? When I met with my sponsor, after some meetings and meetings and meetings every day and calling and calling and calling, we got to the fourth step and to the fifth step. The step that gave me patterns of who I am. The fourth and the fifth step. And in the fifth step, because I thought my sponsor was not going to believe me, I took him pictures of me dressing as Santa Claus. And he's there, he saw them. <laughs> and he told me one thing that day, I don't know if he remember, because I told him this, uh, you know, in my, my resentments about, about this of the kid, he said, there will be one day after you get sober, give the program a chance, let the miracle happen. There will be one day where the program is going to give you the chance to make amends. So how can I make amends to people that I have heard that way? Suddenly one day his his wife got this request from the church and they were supposed to to send some give some you know presents to to a poor family in downtown Los Angeles and they were looking for a for a Santa Claus. <laughs> and I say I go Six years over, I go, and I drive the car, <laughs> and we went, we get presents, we sang together, Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad, all those things, and uh, I say, okay, I pay my amends, but God, my higher power, has a very good sense of humor, and last year, I met this guy who works in the mission, the, the LA mission in that town, and he heard my story. I hope he's not here today. Uh, he heard my story, and he said, Would you dress for Santa Claus for us at the mission on the 24th? And I said, Yeah, yeah, of course. He said, We have about 500 kids coming and everything, and you have to be there at 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh my God. <laughs> God, I already make amends with my sponsor. <laughs> but I went. Last year, the 24, I was there at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I took my daughter with me. And she helped me to dress as Santa Claus. And she gave the presents to the poor kids that show up. And there was one kid that got there and they started crying. And held me and hold me. And I gave him a big hug. And I got this boy as mine. And I told him, you know what? You represent so much to me. You are so much to Santa Claus today. You are the most special thing to Santa Claus. 
Because I'm making amends in you of somebody that I heard before. I love you. Thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you for giving me the, the, the capacity to be honest. Thank you to giving me back my feelings. I love you, all of you, and have a Feliz Navidad, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.